For generations, nursery rhymes have been a pivotal part of childhood, but have you ever paused to contemplate their origins? These whimsical melodies hold a rich history far beyond their innocent facade, concealing surprising secrets. Take, for example, Three Blind Mice. Beneath its seemingly harmless exterior hides a story not intended for children, with a gruesome past that may astonish you. Join me as we embark on a journey to unveil the true meaning of this rhyme, peeling back layers of history to reveal the hidden origins behind its verses. Welcome back, Darklings. Before we delve into the gruesome history of this rhyme, let's first revisit the most widely recognised version. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife, who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a sight in your life as three blind mice? This rhyme made its debut in print as far back as 1609 in a book titled Deuteromelia, or the second part of music's melody, edited by the English musician Thomas Ravenscroft. Yet its origins likely precede this publication, as the book itself is a compilation of widely recognised common songs, hinting at a deeper history waiting to be uncovered. While the lyrics may differ from our modern version, the essence remains the same, accompanied by the unmistakable tune we still sing today, albeit at a slower pace. Three blind mice, three blind mice, Dame Julian, Dame Julian, the miller and his merry old wife, she scraped her tripe, lick thou the knife. We will revisit to dissect those intriguing lyrics later on, but for now, let's explore the chilling historical event that is believed to have inspired this rhyme. Oxford is one of the world's most famous university cities. It's a stunning destination, brimming with history and adorned with graceful honey-coloured buildings. Its pathways beckon you to traverse through time, crossing ancient stone bridges and encountering some of Britain's most renowned landmarks. But amidst the romance and beauty, there is a darker side. In the heart of Broad Street, a cross-shaped arrangement of cobbled stones stands as a sombre reminder of a haunting event that still echoes through the centuries, an event that could potentially unlock the secrets behind three blind mice. The prevailing theory suggests that the mice symbolise three bishops, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley and Thomas Cranmer, figures pivotal in England's Protestant Reformation. This movement was sparked by King Henry VIII's quest for an annulment from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, in the 16th century, leading England to break away from Rome and transition from Catholicism to Protestantism. These bishops played crucial roles in this transformation, which continued under Henry's son, Edward VI. However, Edward's premature death at age 15 resulted in Mary Tudor, the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, ascending the throne in 1553. Queen Mary sought to restore Catholicism in England, leading to the persecution of Protestants during her reign. Her harsh actions earned her the moniker Bloody Mary, and she is believed to be depicted as the farmer's wife in the Three Blind Mice nursery rhyme. Queen Mary wasted no time in targeting the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, with Latimer, Cranmer and Ridley at the top of her list. In early 1554, these three men found themselves confined together in a cell within the Tower of London, before being transferred to the Bocardo prison in Oxford to await trial for heresy. Remarkably, the door to their prison cell remains on display at St Michael at the Northgate Church in Oxford, serving as a poignant reminder of their ordeal. Facing the threat of public burning, unless they recanted and embraced Roman Catholicism, Latimer and Ridley remained steadfast in their convictions and were consequently sentenced to death. However, Cranmer succumbed to the pressure and renounced Protestantism, submitting to the Roman Catholic faith. On October 16, 1555, the chilling sentence was carried out. Cranmer was forced to witness the fate of his friends from a nearby tower. In the midst of a large crowd, Ridley kissed the stake and both men knelt in prayer. Despite a 15-minute sermon imploring them to repent, they remained steadfast. Subsequently, they were bound to the stake, each with a bag of gunpowder around his neck. In a moment of unwavering resolve, Latimer turned to Ridley, speaking the words, Be of good comfort, play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. As the flames engulfed them, Latimer succumbed to the smoke, his death mercifully swift. However, Ridley's fate was far more agonising. 
his brother-in-law's misguided effort to expedite Ridley's demise by adding extra tinder to the pyre inadvertently worsened the situation, causing the fire to burn slower and intensify his suffering. Writhing in excruciating agony, Ridley's desperate pleas to God for mercy echoed through the air. In a final act of desperation, he was compelled to thrust his face into the flames, igniting the bag of gunpowder around his neck and ending his torment. Despite Cranmer renouncing Protestantism, Queen Mary ordered his execution to serve as an example to others, and just five months later, he faced the same fate on the very spot where his comrades perished. Before his death, Cranmer was escorted to the University Church in central Oxford for a final opportunity to recant. Instead, he boldly proclaimed his Protestant beliefs, denouncing the Pope as Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrines. This defiance led to his immediate removal from the pulpit and his swift journey to the stake. As the flames consumed him, Cranmer held up the hand that had signed his recantation, plunging it into the fire, declaring, This is the hand that offended. The intensity of the fire left a set of nearby doors scorched, serving as a poignant reminder of the fervour with which the Oxford martyrs held to their beliefs. Today these doors are displayed between the quads of Balliol College, a solemn tribute to these men. The site of their execution remains marked by a small cobblestone section in Oxford's Broad Street, preserving their memory for generations to come. But why are these men portrayed as blind mice in the rhyme? During the 16th and 17th centuries, the term blind did not necessarily denote physical sightlessness, but often symbolised spiritual darkness or sinfulness. This usage draws parallels to Christ's miraculous healings of the deaf, dumb, lame and blind, where these afflictions were associated with sin. Hence, the blind mice in the rhyme may symbolise spiritual blindness, implying they are unenlightened, unable to see the truth about their faith. Furthermore, the choice of mice as symbols may carry deeper connotations. Mice were commonly regarded as pests, representing nuisance and weakness. By portraying the bishops as mice, the rhyme may subtly convey a derogatory depiction of them as cowardly and troublesome figures. Viewed through this lens, the rhyme appears to reflect a pro-Catholic sentiment, although the mice could equally serve as a more general metaphor for human vulnerability and inclination towards sin. Returning to the original rhyme, let's examine the significance of the last line. She scraped her tripe, lick thou the knife. Tripe, also known as offal, is the stomach lining of farm animals such as cows, pigs, sheep and goats. Historically, it was inexpensive and favoured by the lower class, while being avoided by the elite. But beyond its culinary context, tripe was commonly used to describe someone as worthless or unintelligent. Over time, it evolved into a term encompassing anything deemed stupid or worthless, but during the period when the rhyme was published, tripe, as slang, would specifically refer to individuals with these negative connotations. The line may hold profound implications, hinting at the purging or elimination of individuals deemed insignificant. It seems to be representing a cleansing, evoking the notion of discarding what is considered sinful or repulsive. It may even allude to Queen Mary's reign of terror, marked by the systematic eradication of Protestants from the country. This original rhyme also references Dame Julian. However, it's important to note that this actually means Dame Julian with a J. This variation in spelling arose because the letter J was one of the last additions to the English alphabet. The transition from I to J was first observed in the 1629 edition of the King James Bible. Prior to this, Names like James and Jesus were spelled with I's rather than J's. Dame Julian was an anchoress who resided in Norwich, located in the east of England, from approximately 1342 to 1416. An anchoress was a woman who dedicated her life to God by inhabiting a small solitary room or cell attached to a church. These women would be permanently walled in, unable to leave for the entirety of their lives, with only a small window providing a view into the church. This allowed them to participate in church services, converse with visitors seeking spiritual guidance, and receive provisions while also managing waste removal. Anchoresses have appeared in nursery rhyme history before, as discussed in my video about Peter Pumpkin Eater on this channel. Most notably, during her time in seclusion, Julian penned what would later be recognised as the Revelations of Divine Love. 
These writings stand as the earliest surviving works authored by an anchoress in England and by a woman in the English language. What's intriguing, particularly in relation to Three Blind Mice, is that although Julian enjoyed a certain degree of recognition during her lifetime, both she and her writings faded into obscurity until their publication in 1670, nearly 60 years after the appearance of Dame Julian in the nursery rhyme. Her unexpected inclusion in Three Blind Mice has left historians thoroughly perplexed. It's also worth noting that Dame Julian is often depicted alongside a cat. According to regulations outlined for anchorites in a 13th century manuscript, they were permitted to keep a single cat to assist in controlling vermin. Whether there exists an ancient tale of Julian's cat chasing three mice, or if it symbolises Julian imparting enlightenment to three visitors, blind to the word of God, remains uncertain. While it's unclear if the three mice reference the Oxford martyrs, the imagery within the three blind mice undeniably suggests strong religious undertones. Some also speculate that the three mice could represent the Holy Trinity. But what do you think? Could the three blind mice symbolise the Oxford martyrs, or do you have an alternate interpretation of this mysterious rhyme? Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if your thirst for nursery rhyme origins still lingers, don't forget to subscribe and explore the rest of my channel. See you in a future video.